General Dia alleges that there was a phantom coup and that he was a victim of that coup. What response do you have to that? My Lord, as evidence in Lagos, General Dia, with due respect to him, with due respect to his rank, with due respect to his position his hair he held, was not telling the whole truth of the whole matter that happened. The coup was real. My Lord, the coup was real. It was a case of real coup d'etat and some phantom generals within the real coup. He lied also that the same cloth he was arrested while was the same cloth he was taken to jail with. He defecated in Mustafa's office that very day when he was brought. And that is what made us to leave the office because we could not withstand the pungent <laughs> stench that followed. As a result of that, Major Mustafa is alive and is here today. He will confirm he had to change his office to under the tree. And Julius Badger was called that very night to fumigate. <laughs> it's a coup d'etat is a very serious business. It's a matter between life and death. In fact, if within 24 hours, or within even shorter than 24 hours, you don't report anything could happen. Because as you all know, coup d'etat is a lightning operation that doesn't, uh, I mean, take a long to actualize if the plan had uh, been put in place. So, predicated on that question, General Chris Garba, I hope he will be brought because my Lord, the last has not been heard about this 1997 coup. And if it is not heard, it will amount to beating a snake, thinking that it is dead, only for it to recuperate and resurge again to continue to ravage the populace. Brigadier General Dr. Ibrahim Al Haji Sabo do solemnly swear that the evidence I shall give before this honorable commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. On this episode of Oputa Panel, we meet the highly intelligent and crafty Brigadier General Ibrahim Sabo. There is very little public information on General Sabo and the general public only got to know about him at the Wuputa panel. He was the former Director of Military Intelligence under General Sani Abacha's regime and he played a lot of clandestine roles for the government including exposing the failed 1997 coup plot. He was implicated during the Oputa panel in an alleged frame-up of top-serving military officers in the phantom coup that led to the arrest and subsequent detention of President Olusegun Obasanjo and his former deputy, the late Major General Shehu Musa Yaradua, General Oladipo Dia, and several others. His testimonies at the panel exposed a lot of the underhand workings of the army during the military era was retired in 1998 by General Abubakar and he seems to hold a grudge against General Abubakar and General Bamiri for his early retirement. Sabo is being led by his counsel Umar Shetien and the sitting took place on the 26th of July 2001. 
Brigadier General Sabo passed away on January 1st, 2022 after a brief illness. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to like, subscribe, share and drop us a comment. Let us know what you think and we'll see you in the next video. Which is uh, the petition filed by Lieutenant General Oladu Kodia dated the 10th of August 1999. In that petition, Particularly on page 7, the first paragraph on page 7, if I may read, he asks for you to be or for, for an order on Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Yakasai, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Omenka, Brigadier Sabo, Sergeant Rogers, under whatever name or alias he uses and all others involved to give evidence about the matter in the light of various confessions from prison and their sinister roles under the Abacha regime. Now, did you have anything to do with the arrest of General Dia? No, my Could lord. Do please tell the commission. No, my lord. Did you have anything to do with his detention at all? No, my lord. Did you have anything to do with his trial? No, my lord. At any given time, did you ever have the prox proximate relationship with Dia to enable you to uh, torture him in any form? Well, Dia said that he was tortured, and it is true he was tortured. No, by you. Did you not ever by, torture him? Not by me, but I am very well aware that he was tortured. Would you like to tell the commission how you know he was tortured? On the day, I cannot remember exactly the, uh, the date. On the day they were arraigned before the Special Military Tribunal in Jos. In the evening, well, before I say this, so let me give certain preambles first. My Lord, my evidence is going to be in three parts. But one is what I'm doing now, response Sorry, to the... Sorry, you reduce it into writing, in which case you may tender it and read it. Uh, you reduce what you're going to say. We, we yes, intend to submit it. To come off we'll we'll submit it later to your lordship, sir. We'll submit it later. Well, if you reduce into writing, tender it, no, it's mark not. it, and then read it. It has not been reduced into writing yet, but it will be reduced to writing. Right. Yes, go on, please. The second part will be analysis of uh, Dia's evidence. Some aspects will be attempted. The third part is the... I have a duty to tell the nation whether there was a coup or coups within coups. Now, will you start with the first one? Dia's response to Dia's uh, petition. Yes. In Jaws, I mean in Lagos, Dia was asked whether I tortured him. He said no. I, for, I mean, I can understand why he said no, because he didn't see me physically there torturing him and so on and so forth. That's right. But as I was saying, on that very day, they were arraigned before the Special Military Tribunal. When Dia got up to say it was a phantom coup, arranged from the highest body, from the top. That very day in the evening, at around uh, precisely 11 o'clock in the night, I was away to see some relatives because I was born and brought up in Jos, and I was seizing that opportunity to see relatives. On return to our accommodation, the then Provost Marshal Brigadier General Yusuf Amoda Abubakar, retired, told me that the Chief of Army Staff, then Major General Ishai Abameyi, wanted to talk to me frantically over the phone. When I tried to call the Flagstaff House, I was told he was not in. Then later, I got in touch with him. He told me that uh, why was there allowed to say the things he was saying? 
to embarrass the government. I said, well, I what also... Was saying, what do you mean, what he was saying, where? At the SMT1, he said that the coup was arranged from the top. I see. Go on, please. Then he asked me, where is Sergeant Rogers? I said, Rogers is in the prison. He is keeping uh, uh, vigil over the detainees. Then he asked whether they were on phone. I said, yes. I gave him the telephone number. General Bamey is here. Then he said, in case he couldn't get him, I should tell Rogers to go and deal with there a bit so that he will not be telling lies. Now, did you convey the message to Sergeant Rogers? I have no option but to do that because it was an instruction given to me by my superior. Now, uh, General, General Dia, oh sorry, the Sergeant Rogers, in uh, evidence in, I think, another case before this uh, commission in Lagos, requested, actually wanted to apologize to Dia for something he didn't mention. But unfortunately, Dia was not in the commission on that day. Do you recall that incident? And if you do, can you relate it to the message you gave Rogers in Jaws? Uh, when uh, Rogers said that he wanted to apro uh, apro apologize to General Dia on something he has done to him, uh, well, the only, one, the only thing I knew was the torture. If he had any other thing outside that, I wouldn't know. Now, what other aspect of General Diaz's testimony do you want to respond to? Well, I still want to respond to this uh, torture thing, my lord. The instruction was given to me, and telephone call to the prison had been collected. I had no other ways of avoiding to carry out the instruction. Because as a second lieutenant, on precisely the 10th of September 1972, a day after my commission from the Nigerian Defense Academy, I signed Armed Forces Oath. And I have a copy here. My Lord, I seek to tender that uh, the oath, my Lord, a copy of the oath. Standard marked Exhibit 39. Please, can you read uh, Exhibit 39? Read it out. Let's see what it says. Yes, sir. Yes, my lord. Armed forces of I, Second Lieutenant Ibrahim al Sabo, swear by Almighty God that I will bear true and faithful allegiance to the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and Head of State Nigerian military government, and that I will truly and faithfully serve the Republic of Nigeria as by law established as an officer uh, until retirement age, that I will as a duty be bound to serve for the period of my engagement or re-engagement as the case may be, go wherever ordered by land, sea, or air and that I will observe and obey commands of the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as by law established, and of the officers placed over me. I would like to emphasize that. And of the officers placed over me, I will subject myself to all acts 
subsidiary legislation and service regulations which now are or shall from time to time be in force and applicable to the arm in which I am to serve during the period of my engagement or re-engagement as the case may be. Sign. I, uh, sabo, uh, my signature here is different from what it is now because I had a very terrible That's period. all right. That's all right. No, I just want to explain so that uh, my signature is not uh, a question of this. Thing. I changed the signature later when somebody coined it. It was simple and cashed my money from the bank. <laughs> so it's no more the same. But that was my signature as a second lieutenant. Signed in the NDA Kaduna on the 10th day of September 19... 1972. Thank you Before very much. Thank you very much. Now, the effect of this, in other words, is that the telephone call, the orders you gave Rogers was an order which you were conveying from a superior officer of yours and which was a duty you had to obey. Exactly, my lord. Thank you very much. Now, please, can you take a look at uh, other aspects of uh, General Dia's testimony? General Dia alleges that there was a phantom coup and that he was a victim of that coup. What response do you have to that? My lord, as evidence in Lagos, General Dia with due respect to him, with due respect to his rank, with due respect to his position his, uh, he held, was not telling the whole truth of the whole matter that happened. The coup was real. My lord, the coup was real. It was a case of real coup d'etat and some phantom generals within the real coup. Well, can you explain this to, <laughs> to the commission and those of us who are, don't understand? Yes, when I come to give uh, the details of what transpired, that's the time you go ahead. the phantomness uh, of the two generals will uh, emerge. But let me start by enumerating some of the lies they are told the panel. Not all of them that had been thrashed out in Lagos. In his evidence, he claimed that uh, we were handcuffed and we were in Mustafa's office. When Dia was brought in Al Mustafa's office, he no, did Sorry, not when you say we, who are you? That myself, General Bamei, General Magashi, uh, ABM ED Musa, that he met in Mustafa's office, we were all handcuffed. We were not handcuffed. He met us freely. He himself, he came into that office not handcuffed. And that Mustafa came and announced that you are all under arrest. It was a lie. Mustafa is here. Mustafa was inside his office. When Dia was brought, we were all seated. Dia also made mention of one Lieutenant uh, Ibrahim that he knew him when Dia himself was the commandant of the Nigerian Army School of Infantry many years ago, about 15 years. That officer couldn't have been a Lieutenant for 15 years and still a Lieutenant. When Dia was testifying, General uh, Adisa was brought to confirm whether a letter tendered by Major Mustafa was his own letter to the late head of state. Dear, switch off the microphone that he was holding, just like I'm holding, he switched it off and whispered to uh, General Adisa not to own up the letter. The NTA is here, NTA is alive, the microphones are all working. NTA aired it live and the whisper was heard when they now broadcast the whole proceeding. What did he whisper? That uh, General Adisa should not own up. To the letter. To the letter. Thank you. Please go on. 
He lied also that the same cloth he was arrested while it was the same cloth he was taken to jail with. He defecated in Mustafa's office that very day when he was brought. And that is what made us to leave the office because we could not withstand the pungent <laughs> stench that followed. As a result of that, Major Mustafa is alive and is here today. He will confirm he had to change his office to under the tree. And Julius Badger was called that very night to fumigate. <laughs> when I heard the sad commentary of some of the, uh, the foreigners or foreign embassies saying, that dear, the day he was arrested, he changed so many clothes that it was a, a photo trick. I want to say, that very day when he was taken before the head of state, he changed his clothes because he couldn't have been taken in a changed uh, cloth before the CNC. The second time when he was having interview was uh, Major, with, with Major Al Mustafa. I had the cassette the video cassette of that interview he had with Mustafa, but it was taken away from me when my house was searched, ransacked, I was arrested and detained in 1998, exactly on the 20th of October. Yeah. So that is why I'm unable to is there, is there any other lie? Dia also lied that during the coordinating conference of that day, that myself, General Magashi, General Ishai Bamei, and ABM Idi Musa went to his house in Babariga. We did not go for that coordinating conference. It was only General Bamei. Magashi and maybe because I was not there, but I knew the two of them attended the coordinating conference. Hitherto it was uh, hitherto it was agreed that all of us should attend that conference to give it a semblance of being together, like the Dimkas. Uh, this thing we are all together. <laughs> we were told to pretend to be with him to get the full details of the plan. But we were not invited to that coordinating conference as it were. So it was a lie on the part of there to say I was there and that I wore Babariga, although today I'm wearing one. Yeah, you go on please, General. Those are some of the, the other lies I say I don't want to overburden the the panel. It has been table. Oh, uh, vid video clips were shown and so on and so forth. But at this juncture I would want to highlight that hither to my relationship with dear was not uh, as close as it was when this coup plan was hatched. Earlier on, we were on the waving side greeting normal. But when this idea of the coup was mooted, and Dia was told that all the intelligence network were behind him and so on and so forth, he would not even mind breaking protocol to extend his hand across when there was function. There was one in the, uh, that building, the, the Equus Conference Center. International Conference Center. International uh, Conference Center. The late head of state was there, and everybody was there when we got up to go. There left the protocol arrangement, came and shook his, my hand, because now he has found a party man <laughs> in me, because his forbid, uh, morbid fear was the int. And if Ola, General Ola Rawaju were here, he would testify. When his evidence came, he said that, he was very, very afraid of the int. What, but is, when what is int? Intelligence, the military intelligence. But when he was told that I was 
sympathetic to their cause, he relaxed and went along with the plan. General, who is not afraid of the military int? <laughs> well, the military intelligence was uh, overblown, so to say. At least during my time today, I'm proud to say I brought a human face to that organization. Now, was, let's go back to the phantom coup. How did it, how did all this start? Can you please take us through how it all started? We were on tour of formations countrywide with the then Chief of Army Staff, then Major General Ishaya Rizibamayi. Along the line, there was a particular day when Bamayi asked me, he said, I hope you people are keeping a tab on the national security and so on and so forth. I said, sir, we are all ears and eyes on the ground as usual. Then he said, oh, I said, why did you ask that? He said, well, there are some rumors here and there, but that he was not going to tell me the detail until he discussed with the late head of state. Along the line, he broke off from the tour, I think it was Enugu. He broke off, went to Abuja, and then came back. It was at that material time, he said, Dia was planning to overthrow the government and that this is how it went. That he consulted General Aziza about the need to overthrow Jansane Abacha to have a change of government. And he told me that he told the CNC, that's General Bame said that he told the CNC and the CNC gave the directive that we should all play along to pretend that we are sanctioning the move in order to find the nitty gritty of the plan. And Jabame further went on to say he convinced there that all the GOCs were informed and that all the security networks, the Nigerian, I mean, Nigerian military intelligence the direct uh, defense intelligence agencies were all informed and that we are on the same pedestal for the coup d'etat. Having been given this instruction to play along, we now set the machinery rolling. I was specifically taxed because of my relationship with uh, Adisa to take him on by pretending to be going along with him to hear the detail of his uh, of the coup plot. I had a duty, my lord, to do that because loyalty to the nation is above loyalty to friends. We are still very friendly with Adisa. He invited me to Lorin and I went. Uh, what happened, General? Go on. Thereafter, when I had the chat with Adisa, I went with a recording device and recorded all the discussions. And in it, he unfolded the plans on how it was initially to be when the CNC would have gone to uh, the Chief of Army Staff Conference in Nenugu. And that was aborted because he couldn't attend. Then there was another day later when he was to see a foreign head of state that he would have been attacked along the way to the airport, he didn't go. The NIA, National, uh, National, uh, National Intelligence Agency dinner night that he was to attend and that that was the day he was to be blown. In fact, I decided at that material time, even proffer the solution 
that when the CNC is coming to a function, they always go slow. But when they are leaving, they live very fast. And it was better to hit him when they were leaving. It was in the cassette. He also told me, because I prompted him to say, okay, what are the other tentacles you have? Because you cannot just go and organize a coup without having cultivated some people that will assist. He said, I shouldn't mind that Major Mohammed was there in the villa and that he is coordinating that aspect. And one Major Isiaku. I said, fine. So I probably, I wish they can return some of these cases they took away from my house. Now it's a rainy day, but it was taken because at uh, that time, uh, at all costs, I had to be dehumanized and so on and so forth. Whatever the case, I'm not complaining. Yes, go on. So, well, you, then, it is now history that Adisa, in fact, gave evidence in, before in this case that there was actually a coup. Exactly, and That's he right. had an interview with Major Hamza Al Mustafa the same way he had, um, uh, he had with Dia and Fadipe. In that interview, the case was shown in Lagos. And I decided did not object to the fact that he was the one. And he even said it that he had to plead with a major in order to save his life, because there is no uh, spare part for life. Now, General, uh, I would like you to cast your mind back to uh, the information you received from General Bamai about the coup, how it started. Now, from your own vantage position as the Director of Military Intelligence, and having looked and examined all the evidence and all the facts about the so-called coup or phantom coup, do you believe that the whole coup started with a discussion between General Dia and General Aziza? Come again, my lord. Do you believe now that the coup all st the whole coup started with a discussion between <coughs> General Dia and General Patrick Aziza. At that time, yes, I believe. But with the benefit of hindsight, the emerging trends proved otherwise. What were the emerging trends? The emerging trends were certain indicators. Please give the commission that happened indicators. before, during and immediately after the trials. I will take them on. During the investigation in JOS, Colonel Franco Menka asked General Bamei why it took him three weeks to report an event as sensitive as a coup plot. To who? To General Bamayi. He supported that question because he that to uh, Bamayi said that uh, General Bamayi said that he reported the case to the late CNC. He that to the SIP now ordered through uh, Major Hamza and Mustafa he is alive, he is here that he should send the manifest of the presidential flights, especially on the movement of the Chief of Army Staff. It is a common knowledge at that time, most of us were not flying by commercial flights to Abuja, especially the Chief of Army Staff. Even to his hometown, he used the presidential fleet. And it was checked. The period he claimed to have had the discussion with Aziza, and the period he reported the matter to the late head of state, took three weeks. 
Was that normal? It's not normal. It's, it's a, a coup d'etat. It's a very serious business. It's a matter between life and death. In fact, if within 24 hours, or within even shorter than 24 hours, you don't report anything could happen. Because as you all know, coup d'etat is a lightning operation that doesn't, uh, I mean, take a long to actualize if the plan had uh, been put in place. So, predicated on that question, General Chris Garba, I hope he will be brought, because my Lord, the last has not been heard about this 1997 coup. And if it is not hard, it will amount to beating a snake, thinking that it is dead, only for it to recuperate and resurge again to continue to ravage the populace. That is why I have a duty today, as always, to tell the world and indeed this commission about the intrigues, power play, intra and intra, and the unfortunate deterioration of our profession, the military, which had intrinsic values that were held sacrosanct so that the next generation will try to bring it back to the escalator to the good old military that it used to be. Having said this, my lord, the SIP, as I said, if the commission has time, they can invite General Chris Garba to come and confirm certain things that I'm saying now. If I'm lying, he will say so. Go ahead and say what you want. And these are the things. The SIP, based on the inter uh, interrogation given to General May and Aziza, because they are all called, all of us were interrogated to say what do we know about the, the coup. The SIP left, some of them left, just discreetly to Abuja and interviewed and interrogated, in fact, I would say, the late head of state. Major Mustafa is here. He will testify to that. They went there to confirm from him the actual day General Bama reported the coup issue to him. And he was also skeptical. He said, yes, the time lag is what is disturbing him. So they went back. On that very day, when Colonel Frank asked General Bame this question, Bame came, General Bame came out of the SIP. We were to see him off to go. He told me that that Frank Omenka is an embarrassment. I said, how do you mean, sir? He said, did you hear what he was asking me about the decision? I said, yes, sir. We were in the monitoring room, because during the SIP and the SMT, that is what we call the monitoring room, where everything is recorded, and we saw it live. I said, I was there. I didn't see anything wrong in his asking you did that question. Because if number two man had been manacled in chain, both hands and legs, maybe the only person that may not be arrested if involved is the head of state, and he will be foolish to stage a coup for himself. <coughs> so the boy was only doing his job as an interrogator. He insisted that I should post Frank out of the security group to a redundant place somewhere away. I said, okay, sir, if the aim is to monitor him, I will post him to my headquarters so that I will be close to him to monitor his idiosyncrasies 
that were itching you. Predicated on that, for the first time in the history of the Nigerian Army Intelligence, the proposal for posting of DMI was refused. I want General uh, Said, the then Military Secretary Army, to be called upon to either said yes or no to what I'm saying. It was not allowed. That is by the way. During the briefing uh, 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 of the SIP, certain questions also emerged that all the GOCs were informed except GOC 1 Division. Then General Sarki Mutar, why was he not informed? That is a question that remains unanswered until at the post-mortem of the whole issue, which I am going to say during my uh, summation. As I said, there was this offensive reaction to Frank's interrogation by General Bamey. Based on all these incidents that happened, I now move to other indicators. Sorry, my lord, for the pause, because my council was... Being recorded. No, you are being recorded. We can get the transcript. <coughs> On the night 2021, December 1997, the coup plan, as you are all told during this uh, previous sittings, will be heralded in the military, we call what we call the H hour. And H hour means the particular hour when an operation is supposed to start. That H hour was contingent upon the arrest or elimination of Major Hamza al-Mustafa. And so, it was decided Mustafa should remain in the villa, not to go out. Because, as I said, there were certain indicators that we didn't know whether it was a coup or counter coup or coup within a coup and so on and so forth. So the best way to do is to take the safest precaution by yep. not allowing Mustafa to go out of the villa. If somebody wanted to kill him, then he had better go into the villa in his office to do that. And did that he? was almost impossible. He remained in the villa, did he? He remained in the villa until at a particular period, uh, time of that day, during the day, I can't remember the exact time. But that very day on the 20th, General Bamey called Hamza al-Mustafa to say that he should come to his house at Fort IBB. Where is Fort IBB? Uh, it's uh, where the officers, senior officers stay here in Abuja. That's right. Go on. That he should come to his house for some discussions before he goes back. I quickly cogitated over that proposal and came to the conclusion within my heart of heart that that was a very dangerous proposal because the elimination of Mustafa will spring the coup. And we were told to play along to prevent it so that we can know the detailed listen. Why should Mustafa at this juncture be told to come to Fort IBB? Supposing these boys that were planted to eliminate him, uh, eliminate him, then the coup will uh, go. So I quickly used my cell phone in the toilet in the Flagstaff house in Fort IBB, because I took permission from General to go to the toilet. And I called Mustafa, I said, look, I was there when the chief called you. You better not come, find an excuse, and tell him that the CNC has given you an assignment. Because if you come out, I cannot vouchsafe your safety. 
you could be shot. I, I thought I saw Mustafa here. I should have been sitting to hear all this. Thing. Please call Mustafa. Let him come back here. Please go on, General. That was why Mustafa, in his own evidence, also corroborated that he had to send. Now, why do you want to call him? He gave evidence. He said the same thing you are saying. Were you here when he gave evidence? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. yes. He said he was uh, under house arrest. Exactly. He couldn't come out. Yes, sir. He couldn't so go home because his death would be the signaling of the. He said so. Exactly, sir. Uh, can we have a transcript? Mustafa's transcript, please. So, my lord, I talked to Mustafa not to come. And that is why Mustafa, in his evidence, also said that he had to send dummies, his own vehicle that he had been using to go around to fake his movement. Now, Mustafa did not come. Mustafa did not go. If he had uh, gone, he wouldn't have been here today. Now, what's the next indicator? The next indicator, my lord, was when we all dress up to go to lure General Adisa, because the arrangement was that after Mustafa had been arrested or eliminated, that General Bamey and all of us will go to General Adisa's house to correlate, to correlate the whole event before General Magashi could come and give the broadcast and then the coup is actualized. That was the plan. This indicator, yes sir, this indicator that I'm saying is that when we left the Flagstaff House on the night 2021, December 1997, we went to uh, ABM Musa's house. General Ishaya Bamey and myself in his car. General Ishaya Bamey was the one driving the car, a Honda. On reaching there, we met Idi Musa and we told him that it is time Adisa is arrested. Because meanwhile, Fadipe and the other people had been arrested. And that uh, we also hope by that time Dia should have also been arrested. General Shai Bambe, he said, no, Idi Musa should not follow us. Idi Musa is alive today. He should be called to say whether I'm telling a lie or not. Please, can you tell the commission who Idi Musa was? Idi Musa was the chief of defense intelligence. The Oga Kota Kota of intelligence. Exactly, the tri-service intelligence. Where we are at the tripod, he was at the apex as oh, the boss. Yes. On reaching there, as I said, Jambame refused Idi Musa to follow us. Based on what happened in the afternoon when Hamza was summoned to come to the Flagstaff House, based on the fact that Avm Idi Musa is a high chief, in fact, the highest chief of, military, of uh, defense intelligence was not allowed to follow us, and that only two of us were to drive to go to Adisa's house, I became very, very suspicious. Hence, I called my orderly, one Sergeant Barnabas, now serving in Port Harcourt, is a military policeman. Because by that time, Major Hamza al-Mustafa, because of uh, we were classified at that time, as what we call HRP, high risk personalities. Because if these people knew that we were just playing along with the aim of getting the details, they would eliminate us. So Mustafa attached BGs to me, bodyguards. So I told Barnabas, my orderly, to bring those BG to follow us. So they came to Idi Musa's house and waited. Before then, this may look pure and less uh, childish, but it is very important to say. Before we left the Flagstaff house, no, pigeons. Why, why don't you finish 
that end first from Idi Musa's house on the beaches. What happened? Go on, go on. Sir, don't forget the trend of the story. Yes. Go on. Yes, sir. Then after that, you can ask him. All right, sir. Yeah, because this thing happened before we went to Idi Musa, so okay. I just uh, ahead, escaped ahead. my memory. Uh, three pigeons were brought to General Ishai Bamei on the table. And now he told one Rosemary, a girlfriend of his, to prepare one for me from the kitchen and bring it to me. Again, that sent the wrong signal to me. I say, if there are three in front of you, why can't I have one out of it? Then the other one can be brought to supplement. <laughs> However, I did not raise any alarm. I waited. They brought the pigeon. When they brought the pigeon, I said, Kai, this pigeon is so well done that I will use it in quenching the thirst in Addis Ababa, because we agreed that when we go to Addis Ababa, we will be entertained before we now effect uh, his arrest, just to not to create uh, any alarm. So they brought the pigeon. I tied it in my cellophane bag and put it in my pocket. <laughs> it was when we came to Avm Idu Musa's house. I went out to go to the loo. I called my orderly Barnabas. I said, "Look, take this and don't eat it. Go and throw it away." <laughs> we left. With Janaishai Bamei driving, I in front with him alone. But I told my boys to be following us. When he saw the ambient light of a vehicle following us, because at that time I didn't know even where we were going, it was later he said he wanted to see his brother, a one barrister, that lady Bamei, now Senator, that lady Bamei sitting here. The ambient light of this vehicle following us, I say, who are those? I say, they are my boys. He say, why should they follow us? We don't want to make news about the whole thing. I say, no, sir, it's dangerous because we are only two driving. We don't know the plan of there and the rest. So the best thing to do is to have a, a backup. And your car can even pack up. What do we do? Do we stand in the road and start calling for reinforcement and so on? So these boys should follow us, so that if there is any problem, they should be the people to extricate us. And that is the normal procedure. You don't go in a hazard operation without a cover. At that juncture, so now use his cell phone and call his boys to follow. So we went. Another indicator in uh, the Lady Bamey's house, native food was brought. General Bama, he said that I may not be able to eat their local soup. I'm saying this with all sincerity, devoid of acrimony or polemics, but based on the truth. <coughs> I felt that again, there is danger. So I told him, I said, sir, before I join the normal uh, uh, modern school, I attended the Islamic school away from my family, so I am used to eating all kinds of food. I wash my hand and say we'll eat from the same plate. <laughs> we ate. And we left to a desired house. When we left to Addis I'm just on indicators. I'm not giving the details of what happened. No, go on, go on. Another indicator, as I said, was the coordinating conference that was to be held in Dia's house, but we were not called to attend. It was General Bamei, uh, Colonel uh, Garba, or Brigade of and then against the CNC directive that all of us should attend. And at that time, I was instructed to come because my own cassette it will be testified, Mustafa is here. My own cassette was the best recording. It was devoid of all the noisy background. I'm not going to say how I did it, because it will give uh, some people <laughs> some antidotes. <laughs> that it was agreed that I should go armed 
with this cassette for the coordinating conference so as to have more evidence. But we were not called. We were waiting in for the IBB when General Bamayi came from Lagos uh, with Magashi General. And we said, okay, are we ready to go to Dia's house now? He said, no, they have already gone. She said, but that was not the arrangement. However, that was an indicator. In Jos, there was this general demeanor, arrested behavior of General Bamey throughout the period when they were confronted between himself, Dia, uh, General Dia, General Disa, General Ola Rajudu, because they were brought before the special military, uh, special investigation panel to confront themselves. After that confrontation, there was this restive demeanor displayed in him. I wish the panel will also ask the defense staff to produce the cassette of that to show what I mean. Another indicator, my lord, during our stay in Jos, during the stay of the SIP in Jos, this time around, I used to leave Jos to come back to Lagos to prepare for what I call my security awareness dialogue with officers and soldiers of the Nigerian army in order to discuss freely with them to avoid uh, them entering into security problems because officers and soldiers at times enter security problems unknowingly. So it behoved to enlighten them on what to do in case there is a security situation. I had already finished drafting my decision, so I came back to Joss to monitor the proceeding of what was going on. This uh, very day, again it was on a Saturday, when General he called me in Joss to say that General Abdul Salam Abu Bakr has instructed him to go to security group that there were complaints here and there. I said, fine. When do you want to go, sir? He said, the middle of the week, either Wednesday or Thursday. I said, that is beautiful. That will give me the chance, and Colonel Frank Menka, who was the substantial CEO of that group, and his twice who was away on pass, to be in Lagos to prepare a brief for you so that fully aware. It's just like the head of state cannot go to a particular state when the governor, the deputy governor, and maybe the speaker of the House of Assembly are not there. I mean, who would brief him? So it was agreed that we were coming to uh, Lagos on Monday. I quickly called Major Al Mustafa to, uh, to book a plan for us from the presidential fleet to take us to Jos on Monday. If that request on that day is now revisited from the presidential fleet file, you will see that that flight did not uh, take place. Why? Because in the morning as we were ready to move to the airport, telephone my headquarters in Lagos that the Chief of Army Staff, General Shai Bamayi, was in security group. On Monday, we were supposed to go and start preparing brief for him. I was not there as the Director of Military Intelligence. The substantive CEO, who knows about everything within that setup, was his twice he was not there. Only one Captain Daramola, who was just posted in, he was, in fact, a rookie as far as uh, that place was concerned at that time. Then, the following day, PM News carried General Bamayi visited security group 
the Gulag and whatever, 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 and order the release of uh, detainees and so on and so forth. We say fine. We analyze the situation and so that we came to the conclusion that there was a preemptive uh, attempt to radical the end to put us off guard from the ongoing investigation. My Lord, a letter was there after written from Army headquarters and copied all the divisions of the Nigerian Army all the institutions, all departments, including the Nigerian headquarters at Ekomog, with information copy to the archives and other places. I'm going to tender it. My Lord, we seek to tender that, uh, that letter. What's the date of the letter? The letter was dated 31st March 1998, and I want it back because I still have to comment. What year was that? No, you'll get the date, no worry. You'll be marked. That's the first one, 1998. That should be 40, I think. Yeah. 4-0. Mm, 4-0. Yeah. Yes. You can have it back. It was divine intervention that prevented this letter from being taken away by the search team that came to arrest us in our houses. I thank God for that. What was the letter about? I think it's a very no, big... Read it. Read yes, it. it's not a long letter. I am directed to observe the arbitrary and unlawful detention of civilians in military detention facilities based on offenses that are either civil or capable of being handled by other appropriate agencies. It is also worrisome to observe that while such illegal arrests and unlawful detentions are carried out, no, the victims are deliberately incarcerated in the guise of endless investigations. Pathetically serving officers, soldiers are also detained under the same circumstances. In view of the irregularity that I am directed to instruct you to release, transfer forthwith all civilian detainees uh, cases in your custody to the appropriate civil authority or government agencies for further investigation and prosecution. Similarly, cases involving serving officers, soldiers should be promptly uh, dispensed with to enable the court martial where necessary rather than perpetual incarceration. Military cells are meant for the confinement of military personnel where the need arises for civilians to be detained in military cells in future, an express permission must be sought and obtained from this headquarters. I'm also to state that this instruction must be, must be given maximum compliance. Sign E. Achibong, Major General for Chief of Army Staff. Based on this letter, on the 9th of April, I replied to the content because a document came, it is going to be in the custody for a long time to come, so I felt that it was, uh, on my, it was a duty on me to reply so that tomorrow Sabo is not there, somebody will come and see the response. We responded. The letter is a bit long, but the meat of it all is, we highlighted to the Chief of Army Staff that DMI detention uh, cells are more or less like a clearance house for other agencies because it has been the one that had been established. NDLE used to bring their personnel there for safe custody. Defense Intelligence Agency also used to bring their own detainees for safe custody. Some other parastatals paramilitary use to bring them for custody. And all this thing we send weekly report to Army headquarters to show the level. 
And we also highlighted to the Chief of Army Staff that some of the detainees there were there on his own orders. We attach all the relevant annex. You must have heard about the celebrated case of an 18-year-old boy being detained there. We have the exhibit here with the signature of General Bame giving the authority for that. In it, General Magoro made a complaint. And I think it's very serious, sir, for the commission to take note of that. During the military dispensation, there were lots and lots of abuses of privilege. General Magoro made a complaint about some civilians who duped him. This time around, I was preparing to leave for all college. In fact, I had already signed off. When General Shai Bame minuted to the CO security group, Colonel Frank, and his minute was, please see if you can, for, uh, for all, uh, uh, no, that's not the one, sorry. That's the one he sent to the DMI later. I'm sorry, my lord, I'm just trying to fish it out. Very good. He said, Frank, we spoke. Please act. Sign. <laughs> General Ishai Bamei. Frank said that he was not the DMI. So he could not act on that. So General Bamei, on another sheet, he said, DMI, please see if you can forward Lieutenant Colonel Frank to look into this. In the military, when a boss say, please, if you do that, it's an order. So it was investigated, and the person who defrauded General Mogoro to the sum of uh, 44,186,700 Ghana Naira only was unable to refund the money. Then he, he, he now said that he wanted to go and uh, get the money to settle the issue. What Frank told me, because as I said, I've already signed off to go to War College, was that General Obama, he told him that there must be somebody to stand in while the man goes to look for the money. And Frank said the only man, the, the only child the man came was this boy, his son. He said, grab him. He was grabbed and detained. You mean the 18-year-old boy? Yes, my lord. Then there were other issues. There were other detainees. There was one, uh, one NGCon. NGCon is a company dwelling in oil and other issues. One Mr. Ray Hyde was a friend to General Bamei. But the information that came to us was that there was a deliberate sabotage around the security of oil insulation in Nigeria. And that we should look into it. This issue was taken very serious because oil is the mainstay. And any threat to it is a threat to national security and interest. So we went into this, this uh, investigation. Along the line, we discovered that rather than a threat to national uh, to oil insulation, it was indeed a fraud between two parties, one party defrauding the other. But what made us to continue with the investigation, we also found along the line the defrauding of the federal government to the tune of about 117 million naira in tax evasion. We started that investigation, including this one that was going on, because it was investigation within an investigation. 
then the then chief of defense staff then major general abdul salam al haji abubakar called me to say that one of the parties involved is his friend one al haji kolere that we should look at it in order to stop this investigation i told him i said sir with due respect once an investigation starts we normally don't stop it it is advisable for us to conclude it then if there is anything that will come after it will be on record that alhaji kolere followed me to nikon when we came for meeting in abuja that time i hadn't got a house here in abuja to my room how did he even come to know about my where about it remained a dream until later when i knew how because we used to enter nikon hotel with pseudonyms for obvious reason because when we come for meeting we carry classified documents if i give my actual name somebody may bump into my room and carry them away so we use give pseudonyms the man knock at my door and i open and i saw him i said ah, whom do you want he said he is alhaji muhammad kolere he was sent by the cds then abdul salam abubakar to come and discuss with me about this ngcon issue i said ah, how did you come to know about my i said anyway what is it he said look gen uh gen uh, colonel then i was a colonel i think we can make some deal why don't you people take 50% of the total sum and give and allow us to go away with the 50% of the total sum that translated up to about uh, almost 49 to 50 million dollars um, naira sorry naira I told him to sit down when he came in. When he started this narration, I said, "Alaji, stand up." I told him, "I said, I thought you are a gentleman. I only gave you the respect because you came from a boss. And henceforth, for your information and in your own interest, never you come to where I live. Every transaction you want to hold with me, hold it in the office. I chased him out of my hotel room, and I had to change." the hotel room that time avm ed musa had secured his accommodation in fort ibb so i begged him to stay in his place because i don't know what will follow he could use the same trick to locate where i was then later on i call general salam abubakar i said this man came and i don't know even how he got to my room then he said no that he was the one who gave him the room because when we talked his cellular battery was weak so he asked me the room where i was staying in nikon so that he could call me back when he reaches home so that is how alhaji kolere got to know where i was staying this ngcon issue was one of the issues that jabba may task us and it was carried out how was it concluded my lord as i told you i was about to go to work college at that time I left for college it was concluded with the return of the evaded tax money from all the parties to the government coffers how much was that i i don't know if i can get my bag there maybe i put it there i have a I have uh, the photocopy of the the check and the letter of commendation
Yes, my lord. I have uh, the documents here. The amount involved in this particular payment was to the tune of they were in two batches. Uh, one was to the tune of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. 14 million six hundred and thirty six thousand four hundred and forty two point three and the other one was 22 million again nine hundred and five hundred and nine naira and this money was uh, returned I will tender it first before I read the whole this thing. all right my lord what about the letter of commendation it's also here, my lord. Yeah, put them all together. Pardon, my lord. What to tender that from? Oh, yes, sir. The receipts for the payments of tax to the federal government and the letter of commendation. 41. Exhibit 41. My Lord, this letter was from West African Oil Field Services, addressed to the Directorate of Military Intelligence on the 1st of April 1996. Uh, Papa, attention Lieutenant Colonel Frank Omenka because he was the one handling the, the matter. Payment of value added tax, but reference your letter dated 290396 and please find uh, following attached bank drafts. First bank draft to the tune of 22,920,509.7 uh, naira. First bank draft again, FA 1213632 for the tune of 14,636,414.3 naira. Million. The payments were done in bits and pieces. This is the only one that I can lay my hand on. As I said, my house was ransacked. Documents were carted away. Again, God saved me that uh, some of these things were still around. While the second drive is for the full payment and final VAT liability by WAOS, I don't know what it means, still stand. This payment covers both Naira and Dollar invoice number 0279 and, two, and 0279A for all the payments received so far and dollar conversion worked at 84, 84 naira to the dollar at that time. Worst liability is confirmed and accepted by DEC NGCON as full and final VAT payment accumulated to date. While thanking you for your full cooperation, we await further directives. Thank you. Predicated on this letter, check the photocopy of the, the photocopy of the checks are attached here. I cause my uh, Colonel Coordination, a staff officer and me, to write a letter of commendation to security group for a job well done. And the letter reads, letter of commendation recovery of federal government revenue value added tax, but I'm directed to profoundly commend you for the of recovering the three bank drafts of VAT totaling the sum of 43 million, 027, 625.67. This achievement is no doubt commendable, especially at this hard time of the waging war against tax evaders. Please don't relent in your effort and more grease to your elbow. God bless and well done. Sign A.A. Ahmad, 
Lieutenant Colonel for the Director of Military Intelligence. Now, General, if you... Uh, I have not finished, my Lord. Go ahead. Based on this letter which we wrote, reply to General Bamei, like I told you, DMI was a clearing house, and some agencies used to send their detainees to us. I could not possibly release their detainees without responding to the letter. So I wrote a reply to General Bamei to say that the tune of their letter was false to us, that we did not on our own arrest all these civilians as it was perpetrated, uh, it, was, uh, it was purported. Some of the detainees were on his own behest, some are from other agencies. So when we wrote attaching all the relevant documents and everything, sent to his office, it was taken by General Achibon because he was the signatory to our, to that letter that came to us. Achibon called me on the telephone. He said, Ibrahim, I have seen you, I replied, this one is above me, oh. so me, I go pass him as it is, he's above my power, I was only told to write you this letter. Some days after, I cannot remember precisely, Jabba may call Idi Musa and myself to his office to express his displeasure over the way and manner we responded to that letter attaching some documents and making a very large list of addresses. I told him, I said, sir, you are later also left the shores of this country to Ecomog. These addresses we put were not extraordinary. They were security agencies, the NDLA, NIA, uh, SSS, DIA, who also have some of the detainees that were brought to us for self custody. They were in fact the people in charge of their feeding. If the army headquarters can be honest enough to confirm we have not been getting money for the feeding of other detainees. The related agencies that brought them paid for their feeding. The only one we get from Army headquarters are those of the military nature. And it is also interesting to note here, at this material time, a letter came from the office of the Chief of Army Staff to say that there was some cult, uh, 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 I mean, there, were, there was cultism rearing into the military. And information had that some officers and soldiers were involved in this cultism. That formed part of General Bamey's address to troops when we went around the formation to warn officers and soldiers to disease from cultism. He even recalled to them that uh, during the Mutala regime, some officers were retired from the army because of involvement in cultism. These groups were arrested and also detained in the DMI for investigation. Investigation couldn't conclude in time because of this other 97 coup issue that was coming. And my, pers my personnel were dissipated. They were taken to jails. They were engaged with security this thing. And you know, a coup situation, we have what we call a part whole part. And that is, first of all, you get the immediate uh, suspects then go around again to see if there were other elements, sympathizers and so on and so forth, and then come back for the overall distance. So that caused a lot of dissipation, and that is why Bashir Mormoni in his testimony said that he was drafted from 9th Brigade, although he is an in personnel, but he was drafted from 9th Brigade to go and beef off the security in Jos. So these cult people were also among the people General Bame you saw when he visited security group. Let me not digress or derail. Coming to his discussion with us in his office regarding this letter we wrote, I told him we had to copy all these addresses because 
they send their own detainees. We cannot possibly re uh, release their detainees without their clearance. More so, some of the detainees they sent to us are recidivists. They had been arrested over and over again for drug-related issues and other uh, infractions all over. And not only that, even if they had not committed such crimes, we are not the people who put them there. We cannot release what we didn't arrest. So his response was that somebody told him that our response to that his letter was as a result of his visit to security group as a revenge. I told him, sir, you are the chief of army staff. I'm under you. My organization is under you. How can we revenge? So the visit of the security group is now an issue of revenge. You revenge something when it is bad. You don't revenge something when it is good, except if you are going to talk like Idi Amin when he said to the queen that I'm going to retaliate your visit when you come to Uganda. But otherwise, revenge means you are hurt, and then you revenge. Now, General, let's go back to the, the actually the the, prob, the point you would, you want to make with Exhibit 40 is that uh, Exhibit 40 was written as a diversionary <coughs> tactic to to sh to shift your attention away from what was happening in Jaws. Is that right? Yes, my lord. In fact, it wasn't a diversion. It was a real. It was real tactics to divert our attention, although it can be diversionary because diversionary has the capability of being reality. It has to have the ingredients of reality to be diversionary. In military tactics, when we say, I'm going along this axis to the right to attack the enemy, I have a diversionary attack in this line. I don't go with blank ammunition. I go with full-fledged complement of a war, arsenals. So okay. diversionary in this classical sense, yes, it has the capability of turning to real. Now, General, do you have any more uh, indicators? Indicators, you had indicated to the Commission that the list of areas you concerned as you referred to as indicators were those areas which you believe uh, made the coup, uh, put the coup in a different perspective as what it actually was, were made, was made to look at. Look yes, like. yes, my Lord. Based on all these happenings, when investigations and trials were going on, we, myself and some of my security officers in JAWS, we used to have what we call morning prayers before we go to the SIP and evening prayers after the SIP to discuss the situation of the security as per that period. Then the conclusion was that all these uh, indicators were frightening and that there was the need to inform the head of state about the need to try also General Bamayi in that coup of 1997 based on all these indicators. Because in the first place, we were with him in Enugu. He did not tell me as his immediate chief security uh, chap about an impending coup until he, according to his decision, which I don't blame him anyway, but he told some other junior officers now, about you, what he was did going. You, did you write, did you inform the head of state? We wrote, I wrote a letter to the head of state, comprehensive to say in the interest of fairness, in the interest of justice, Janaba Meyi also has a case to answer in this coup. That Hello. letter was personally delivered by me to the late head of state in his office, and that letter remained in his office until he died. Now, uh, you do not know, he did not take any action on the letter before his death? He did not, because he would have uh, called us to say, okay, I've seen your letter, this is the line of action or whatever. Now, did you... Sorry, what about a copy of the letter? 
Do you have a personal copy? Sir, in a situation like that, the chief of army staff is the main issue. I had to use a dedicated typist, the one I trust, to collect both the carbon, the ribbon, <laughs> the draft of that letter from him where I stood by him to type and I collected everything. Like I said, I don't want to be bringing this example, but I have to in order to make a point. When my house was ransacked, a lot of documents were carted away. And the interest of those people who came to search my house were documents that bore the office or the name of chief of army staff or whatever, and general documents that they felt uh, it was necessary. My Lord, I have not finished these indicators. Okay, go back there. One of the indicators was that in 1995, when there was this 95 coup plot issue, I was not the DMI when the whole thing started. I only became the DMI almost towards the tail end of the investigation. And that is why yesterday I was even surprised that Beko mentioned my name instead of him to pour in comments for my humanitarian angle of him. Because I did it at my own risk. Major Mustafa is here. When I did it, I quickly told Mustafa that this is uh, what happened. I had because the man is not feeling fine and so on. Mustafa like he said he had already been informed and that that was, I was quite in order in doing so. I was surprised yesterday, instead of him to pour him, come, well, you ask him, and he cleared me. He was the only one who came to say about this 95 uh, coup issue. In 95, for the first time in the history of Nigerian army, a security awareness dialogue was initiated. With all sense of humility, I initiated it because I cogitated to see that a lot of coup and attempted coups had been taking place. And in the end, when you arrest some officers, the story you hear is that of ignorance in the involvement. So I said, okay, I will take a security awareness drive to all the formation in the Nigerian army so that officers and men will be enlightened because some of them will be afraid to report a coup d'etat because they feel that their boss may be involved and so they keep it to themselves and be they become uh, guilty of concealment. So we, we had a dialogue with them generally. That was 95. It was then General Kazir who was the chief of army staff. He funded the publication of those pamphlets. I call it security awareness dialogue one. If the commission wants it, I can bring the copies tomorrow. Then in 1997, when this coup issue came again, I wrote to the Army headquarters, giving an estimate of about 800 and something thousand naira to, publish, uh, to, to, to make publication about the second stanza, bringing the lessons of the first and the relapsing of officers into some of the security problems so that I could go again for the second beat of the security awareness dialogue. The reply I got from the chief of operation that time was that the chief of army staff had directed that I must send my draft of the security awareness dialogue before money could be released. I said, that is not usual. The first time I did this, nobody asked me for a draft. This time around, I'm being asked for a draft. Because I have all these indicators at the back of my mind. I say maybe he wanted to see if I could involve him or whether I will implicate him in the security awareness drive. I was not going to press for that for the money. I borrowed money from somebody, a friend of mine, made the publications and went on the security awareness drive. 
With all these indicators, you don't require the clairvoyance of Nostradamus or the clairvoyance of any seer to know that there is something cooking. So, my Lord, as I said, we wrote this, I wrote this letter to the late CNC, and uh, there was, uh, in, in the letter, in fact, I remember some of the contents. In the letter, we said that that report that Dia initiated the coup or something, there is something to be very circumspect about it. Our analysis in the long run was that because Dia himself confirmed that he had only a one-to-one uh, a, a, a -to -one talk with uh, General, General Bamei, and that he is requesting, if General Bamei was very busy taping him, he should bring the cassette of their first discussion. That cassette was nowhere to be found. So, we came to the conclusion that when General Dia asked General Aziza about the coup plot, that Dia was only acting based on the assurance given to him by General Bame that all the GOCs and their equivalents were fully aware. And that may have sent some uh, chill in the spine of General Bame to say if Dia could open his mouth to start talking to commanders, how many more would he have contacted? And that is why the time lag of three weeks had to be before he reported the matter. When it became apparent that they may have talked to other people. And also it is very important to note, it is very instructive indeed. To